should I gain from his reward? I don't deserve, we don't deserve anything he gives us. But he gives it so freely. So freely. Sing that one more time. And why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an but this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom But this I know with all my heart Father, I thank you for this morning I thank you for the people that are here. God, they braved the weather. God, I just thank you for who you are. God, that you loved us so much that you sent your son to die for us. And he didn't stay dead. He rose three days later. God, and through that, we have victory in you. Father, I pray over all that's going on in this room, God, all that's going on in the lives of the people that are here. Father, that you would give us peace in our situations, in our circumstances. God, if we're walking in anything where we feel there's no hope, God, there's any confusion. you would bring peace. God, I thank you for my brothers and sisters that are here this morning, God, just worshiping you for who you are. And God, I pray that you have spoken to some lives this morning, God, that you have prepared us for whatever it is that we're about to receive, and God, that we would receive it. We would have the ears to listen and the hearts to be obedient. Father, I pray for Alan as he brings this message. Father, that you would use him, that the words he would say would be yours and not his own. Mm. Father, we love you. We thank mm. you for all you're doing. Amen. Amen. Mm. Well, amen. Thank you, Kayla. Uh, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning because he's worthy, he's good. You know, uh, Last night, I was with over 9,000 people at the uh, CFSB Center in Murray, cheering on the regular season champions, co-champions of the OBC, the Murray State Racers, and uh, some folks got pretty excited about that last night with 9,000 people. People were really, 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 
Really, really, really excited. Any Murray State Racer fans here today? Anyone? 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. So today you're worshiping the greatest champion who ever graced this earth, the Lord Jesus Christ. If 9,000 people can celebrate and rejoice and be really excited because a basketball team won a victory, how excited can you be because Jesus won the greatest victory and challenge of all time, your sin, my sin, victorious forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen to the praise of his glory. Can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise today? The great, yeah, the greatest champion. Yeah, all I can say right now is I was a basketball team and I was playing and that's all you gave me, I would probably quit playing the game. I'm just saying right now, if I was a basketball team and I just won the last second shot and all you do is sit there and give me a little old hand clap like this right here and just look and straighten up yourself, I would probably quit playing the game. I'm just saying I really would. I mean, if I was playing the game and hit a last second shot and you were my fans in the cheering section and you cheered for me... I would expect some of you to at least stand to your feet and give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Are you kidding me? Are you? Oh, but wait a minute. But wait a minute. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. No, 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 no. We are too cool. No, 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 no. We're too cool for that. We're too cool for that. We're too dignified. No, we're just too lazy. We're just too lazy to give him all he deserves. Too cool. I come to church to look good, to find my place in the seat. Don't mess me up. Well, you are free. You are free in Christ to be who you are, you are free to worship him. As your heart desires to worship Him, you are free. You're free to sit. You're free to stand. You're free to get excited. You're free to be contemplative. You're free to cry. You're free to smile. You're free to be happy. You are free to be who you are. You really are. You really are. You really are free. You really are. I just know I get excited from time to time. When I think about all he's done for me. I just can't help it. When his spirit gets into your heart. And into your bones. Sometimes you just can't help but be excited. Amen. Mm, 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 mm. Wow. And the reality is that some of us. We have a hard time being celebratory. In our faith. Because we don't want to put on, right? I mean, no one wants a put on, right? No one wants a show or a put on or theatrics that may not be real. The reality is that for some of us today, coming to a place of worship might have been really hard. Not just because of the weather, and I'm sure some of you probably were really, really tempted, right? really tempted to sleep in, stay in. I mean, the weather was really conducive to a long nap this morning. It might have been easy, just physically, right? Just physically easy to take a day and to rest. And so I know that you might have fought some things physically today. I mean, we've been battling at my house this week. My son's had the flu. He's got pink eye. I'm praying I don't get none of that. Some of you might have been battling something in your house this week. Some of us physically, just physically, it's hard to make yourself go. And it has nothing to do with whatever. Just physically, you don't feel like it. And you don't want to go out and just pretend, right? You don't want to pretend. No one wants to pretend, right? But for some of us today... It might have been really hard to come to a place of worship and to fellowship because there's something really big going on in our lives. And it's hard. You're saying, Brother Allen, it's hard for me to celebrate. It's hard for me to worship. It's hard for me because I'm just trying to lift up my head and just believe and think and feel that God does love me, that God does care about me. Because the reality is that I've got some pretty big 
Goliaths going on in my life. Do I love Jesus? Yes. Do I have a heart to celebrate? Yes. Is it hard sometimes when I'm facing such big obstacles or challenges that just seem insurmountable? Goliaths. Big, huge, ugly, nasty challenges that seem to still rob my joy. Some of you have been fighting stuff for years in your family, with your kids, yourself personally. Some of us are battling health issues that we just can't seem to overcome. Just don't feel good. Some of us, some of us are battling serious flesh issues they seem to continue to trip us up. An addiction or some other type of thing in our life that we just can't seem to overcome personally inside ourselves. Some of us, it has to do with relationships that we're in, the job that we work, our careers. It could be anything that's coming against you in your life there just seems to be this insurmountable that you're praying, you're praying. You've even laid hold of the scripture of Jesus when Jesus said, if you say to this mountain, move, it'll be cast into the sea for you. And you're sitting there going, I've spoke to that mountain. I've prayed and I've asked. But the mountain just doesn't seem to be moving in my life. The Goliath seems to continue to come against me. For us, even in our worship, in our praise, we are praising and worshiping and celebrating in spite of some serious challenges in our lives. We have to overcome those to even have a heart to worship and to celebrate. Well, over the next several weeks, we are going to tackle a subject in Scripture, in 1 Samuel. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn over there. Uh, we're turning up the house lights a little bit today. Hopefully you can see your Scripture today. If not, they'll turn them up a little bit more for you. Um, but today we're going to go to 1 Samuel, chapter 17. One of the greatest stories in Scripture. I love this story. I love this story in Scripture. Um, you might have heard of it years ago when you were a kid. In Sunday school or Bible school, you might have had a grandparent that shared this with you. It might have even been in one of your, uh, your first Bibles, like an, uh, an illustrated kid's Bible you might have had when you were younger. Most of us are familiar and we know about the story of David and Goliath. And what I thought was just going to be maybe a standalone message and just looking at this whole story and bringing one message over the last couple of days, God has just showed me that there's so much to this story. There's so much to what's going on in David, his life, the nature of the battle, the challenge he's got with Goliath. There's so much more here than what we can, can cover in one message. So we are just going to make a series out of this study in 1 Samuel 17. And we're simply going to call it Taking on Your Goliath. And I, don't want to, I want to be careful here because I don't want to suggest to you that this passage of Scripture is just to be taken allegorically or metaphorically. Because when you do that, you, you tend to rob it of its, of its true historical nature and essence as a real event, a real story with God's people in real time in real space. So we're not going to allegorize or just to be so metaphorical with this story that we lose a sense of the historical perspective. No, what we're going to do is we're going to look at this as a true historical event that took place within the nation of Israel. It had to do, it had evolved around a conflict that was ensuing in the nation that was ongoing with the Israelites and the Philistines. We're going to understand that God would raise up a man in that midst who would become a king, King David. God had his hand on him 
when he was just a young fella, a young boy, and we're going to see how in that historical context and setting, there was a very real Goliath who emerges on the scene as a representative of the Philistines. He challenges the Israelites because the Philistines had been a war-mongering people, a sea people, pretty much since their beginning, antagonists, nemesis against Israel. But what is going to happen here is that, in, that, that historical battle and that and historical antagonist comes to Israel and, and is manifested in a person named Goliath. And he is no little dude. He's big. He's big. So the first step in this for us, as we see and we understand from a historical perspective that a young man named Goliath with great bravery steps into the valley of the battle. And he takes on the great Goliath. And he slays Goliath with his slingshot. One stone's throw into the head of Goliath. And then there is so much, so much that is symbolized in the historical event of the fact that David would cut his head off. Forever severing the antagonistic influence of the Philistines against Israel, the people of God. So much, so much there in the end of the battle. And then David, who's just a young boy, stands victorious because God, through him, took down the great Goliath. We're going to see in the beginning of this that if we really want victory or at least know how to begin to deal with some of the Goliaths in our lives, we need to understand the nature of the Goliath. So this first message is about understanding the nature of your Goliath. In fact, we should probably just say that together. We're going to understand the what? We're going to understand the nature of your Goliath. We are going to understand the what? The nature of your Goliath. And we start with the nature of the Goliath. By the way, the name Goliath does not mean great one. It does not mean giant. It does not mean gargantuan, gargantuan one. It does not mean anything in regards to his physical stature. The term Goliath basically means exposer. Exposer, the one who exposes. Or rather, the one who reveals. To expose something means to reveal something. And what we understand here is in Goliath's antagonism toward Israel and the army of Saul. As he taunts, as he jeers, as he challenges them, he exposes their vulnerability and their weakness. And that's exactly what happens with the Goliaths of our lives. They expose. They reveal. They come at our very own weaknesses. And that's part of the reason why your Goliath is your Goliath. Because it's getting the best of you. His physical stature is what stands out at the very beginning. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to understand the physical nature of this 
Goliath. So in 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning in verse 1, the stage of the battle is established. The Philistines gathered their armies for battle. Again, the Philistines were a war-mongering people. They occupied a territory southwest of Israel between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River. From the very beginning, from their very beginning, the Philistines at times were allies or deadly enemies of God's people. You'll see them throughout the Old Testament playing vital roles in the lives of people like Samson, Samuel, Saul, and then finally with David. The children of Israel simply could not deal with the Philistines because they had tremendous, tremendous, tremendous military might. They were very advanced. They were advanced in woodworking. They were advanced in metals. At times in Israelite history, they would even go to the Philistines to have their metal works worked on or their spears sharpened and things like this. So the Philistines were advanced in their battle array and in their armament. They were a superior, a superior army. In fact, they were so superior in their might that when God led the children of Israel out of Egypt, He did not take them on the short way. He took them the long way to the land of Canaan through the wilderness. You know why? Because the short way was known as the way of the Philistines. And God said, my people will see them. They will become terrified and afraid. They will run and go back to Egypt. So God, knowing that His people were not ready for battle, He led them not the short way, but the long way around to Canaan. Here stands the Philistines. They're on one mountaintop, if you will. The Scripture says they were gathered for bat battle. They were gathered at Sokal, which belongs to Judah, which is very interesting to me. And I would have to do a little bit more research on this because if they are standing on a mountain that belongs to Judah, then my mind would lead me to conclude that this would be rightful territory to the Israelites, that they would want that piece of property, that that is theirs. It is rightfully theirs, but yet there's the enemy standing on it. And that may just be how you feel today. That there's something you want to get to. There's somewhere you want to be. You might even think and feel that, God, this is what you have for me. And maybe it is what God has for you. But until you figure out how to deal with your Goliath, you're never going to take that hill. You'll never find yourself there. Because your way to that place is not around Goliath. It has to be through Goliath. And you don't know how to deal with your Goliath. So here they stand and they're ready for battle. They camp between Sokah and Azekah and Ephesdamim. The scripture says, And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered, and they camped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in battle array to encounter the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, while Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with what? With the valley between them. And this is where Goliath would come down later in the story and begin to taunt the armies of Israel, the armies of Saul. The Goliath would come into the valley and stand between them and that mountain top. Verse 4 says, then a champion. A champion is someone who has been proven in battle. The champion came out from the armies of the Philistines. His name is Goliath. His name means the exposer, the one who reveals. He exposes, he reveals weaknesses. He's from Gath. He had an incredible height. Here in this text, the scripture says 
that his height was six cubits and a span in the biblical day. A cubit was about the length from the tip of your middle finger to your elbow. That was, it's an approximate length. A cubit. A cubit. Approximately 18 inches or so. So when you, you take the height of this Goliath, which was six cubits, and you times that by 18 inches or whatever, you come out to a very, 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 very large guy. Based on this particular text, he'd come out to be about nine feet and six inches tall. And some of you are already struggling with that. You're thinking, oh my gosh, that, that's unreal. Has there ever been anyone that tall? Could a person get that tall? I mean, did you actually know that in modern history, in the United States, there was a man from Alton, Illinois, the tallest man in the Guinness Book of World's Record, World Records. His name was Robert Wadlow from Alton, Illinois. Stood at 8 foot 11 inches. His shoe size was 37. He died at the age of 22. They said by the time he died, his legs were so weak that he had to have braces to support his legs. I mean, Goliath would be a little bit taller than Robert Wadlow at 9 feet 6 inches. But did you know that in the Greek translation of the Hebrew text, what's called the Septuagint, they have Goliath at 4 cubits, not 6 in the Septuagint. At 4 cubits, he would be 6 foot Six inches tall. And the average man in that day and time, historians tell us, are about five foot eleven, somewhere around there. So still, even at six foot six, he's a tall dude. My grandfather was telling me not too long ago about playing basketball in this area back in the 40s and 50s. He says, Man, if you had a guy that was six foot tall on your basketball team, he was a giant. So anywhere from six foot six inches to nine foot six inches. You have Goliath. Now, I met a guy not long ago who was a pretty big dude. His name is Brave Williams. He plays basketball for the Minnesota Prep Academy. He's 19 years old, 7 foot 2 inches tall, weighs 450 pounds. And that's David standing next to him right there. <laughs> Big guy. Gargantuan. Scripture says he had a bronze helmet on his head and he was clothed with scale armor which weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. That's about 15 pounds. I'm sorry, that's 125 pounds. His armament that he carried. If you're 400 and something pounds, I mean, gosh, this guy could be 500 pounds. That's, that's nothing to carry that kind of weight. It would be for me, but not for a guy like Goliath. 125 pounds was his armament upon him. He also had bronze greaves, which were like sh uh, shin guards on his legs, and a bronze javelin slung between his shoulders. And the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, like a woodworker's beam. And the head of his spear weighed 600 shekels. Just his spearhead alone was about 15 pounds of iron. His shield carrier also walked before him. So this is the physical nature of David's Goliath. The physical nature of David's Goliath. Did you know that when David would defeat Goliath? Yes. There would be a physical battle that would be won between David and Goliath. But did you know? Did you know? Did you know? His strength was not from the physical aspect of his life. But his strength to win was from the spiritual aspect of his life. His strength to win the battle. David. His strength did not come from 
the physical aspect of his life. Because he's just a boy. He's a young guy. He's a little dude. The strength to win his battle did not come from the physical aspect of his life. His strength to win the battle came from the spiritual aspect of his life. And could it be, could it be, could it be that whatever it is, whatever your Goliath is that you are dealing with today, as long as you try to fight physical battles, say it is a physical battle, only with physical strength, you're probably not going to win. There's a good possibility that you're going to have to lay the physical aspect to the side and embrace the spiritual aspect and begin to fight even your physical battles with a spiritual strength before you ever physically engage them. And let's be honest. Some of us fail today in fighting these battles because we take off after it in the physical strength of our being and we hit it and we fail. We try everything we can. We come up with our own solutions, our own understanding, our own intellect, our own strength, our own power. We try to do this in the physical, but the answer may not be in the physical. The answer may very well be in the spiritual. And once the spiritual infuses the physical, then it seems that Goliaths can come down. Reminds us of the spiritual nature of so many of our battles. I think Paul highlights this very well in Ephesians chapter 6. I love this because it really helps us to understand some of the battles that we're dealing with. He said in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. He highlights the spiritual aspect of the battle. And then he tells us very specifically in verse 12. For our struggle. Say that with me. Our struggle. Our struggle. Say that with me. Our struggle. My struggle. Your struggle. And I want you to think right now in your life. What seems to be the greatest struggle that seems to be recurring in your life, the Goliath that exposes and reveals your weakness that continues to come against you, that drives you to your knees every single time. And so many times you want to give up and you want to quit. And so many times you try to tackle it physically, but you seem to fail over and over and over again. Our struggle, my struggle, your struggle, Paul says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. For years I've understood this as our fight is not with people, although Satan may be using people in the physical in mighty ways. Our fight is not with the physical. Even though our spiritual enemy, the evil one, might be coming at us through the physical. Have you ever just, in a relationship, maybe your marriage, with your kids, or whatever, you thought, they're driving me nuts. Some of you are thinking, she drove me nuts this morning. You're thinking, oh, he drove me nuts this morning. You're thinking, they're just driving me crazy. They're going to put me under. My kids are going to put me under. No, Satan's trying to put you under through your kids. He's using the physical to come at you. The true nature of the battle is not physical. The true nature of the battle is spiritual. And until you begin to fight it on a spiritual le level, you're not going to win. Or even have a chance to win. Our struggle is not with flesh. So stop fighting each other. Start engaging in true, real spiritual warfare. Well, I talk to them till I'm blue in the face. Stop talking to them. Start talking more to God. They won't listen to me. God will. Won't hear a thing I say. God does. 
Have you ever dealt with something in your life and, and man, it troubled you, it bothered you, and, and the next thing you know, you found yourself praying and praying and praying and praying and praying and praying. You almost just kind of took your hands off of it. You just pretty much, God, I give up. And then about a week later, God does something that blows your mind. You go, man, I wish I'd given up years ago. And God's saying, well, thank you very much. I was waiting for you to give up because you just kept getting in my way. Trying to do it on your own power, on your own strength, because you thought the nature of your battle was physical. It's not. It may be manifesting itself physically. But I promise you, if you're going to have any peace, any resolve, or even any victory, it'll come from a spiritual aspect of your life intervening, God stepping in, and either giving you a peace so that you can move on, or giving you the strength so you can tackle your Goliath once and for all and watch him fall. Paul says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of weakness in the heavenly places. The other thing about understanding the nature of your Goliath is this. Everything that we've read about at this point in 1 Samuel 17, David doesn't know any of this. Because he's not there. Here's what we know about David coming up to 1 Samuel 17. What we know about David is that God anointed him in 1 Samuel 16... We know that he was the youngest son of a man named Jesse. And by the way, when he was selected and chosen and anointed, God said about the choosing to Samuel of the one who'd be anointed to become eventually the king of Israel. He said, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature because I've rejected him. Speaking of who would be the one other than David. For God sees not as man sees. God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And what makes David a champion before he ever fights the fight is not his physical stature or anything in regards to his physical strength, but it was his heart. It was his heart. It was his heart. It was his heart. And the scripture says that David was a man, what? After God's own heart. And it would just stand to reason for us today. If we would be people after God's own heart. Then he would make us and give to us hearts of champions. I mean, he was a shepherd. He gained favor in Saul's court as a musician. He was, already, he was already a brave warrior. Already a brave warrior. Because as a shepherd, he already had to do some fighting. We're going to see later in the text. He already had to do some fighting. And we're going to come face to face with a principle that what happens in David's battle with Goliath is that he's going, to, he's going to fall back upon the fact that when God was there for him in the little battles, he could trust that God would be there for him in the big battles. He would say, I fought the lion, I fought the bear, and I'll take on this uncircumcised Philistine who comes against and taunts the armies of the living God. His previous battles, however small they might have been in his life, we're preparing him for Goliath. But here's the thing. If we can't figure out how to win the little battles, we're not going to be beating any Goliaths in our lives. I really believe that some of the Goliaths we face today, some of the Goliaths I face today, we as a body, a church, a people, individuals, we are facing these things and God knew that Years ago, we might not have been ready to face those things. Kind of like when he led the Israelites on the long way around the way of the Philistines. 
weren't ready, weren't prepared. He needed for us to walk through some things to win some smaller battles to prepare us for the larger battles to come. But what's interesting about this? Everything that David would have to fight this fight with Goliath, God would add nothing to him that he did not already have. In fact, when Saul would try to add armor to him, David said, this stuff ain't been tested on me. I'm going to go back and I'm going to get the stuff God used in my life in fighting the smaller battles. The same stuff. He will give you to fight the little battles will be the same things he uses in your life to fight the Goliaths when they come. But you might not be ready yet. You know why? You know why? You know why? Because it's not the armament or the things he gives you. It is the strength of your faith. I've seen him do it before. And I believe he'll do it again. But until you see him do it before, you won't have faith there to believe he'll do it again. David had been prepared for this. We see the physical nature and aspect of Goliath. We see this challenge. David didn't know any of this. He's not around at this time. He doesn't show up till he goes to the battlefield to check on his brothers. He's tuning his heart. He's taking care of some sheep. Who knows what he's doing at this point in time? He's nowhere around. But here's the thing. In 1 Samuel 16, God anoints him for what God has for him in his life. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, we'll go back just a few minutes ago. This is amazing to me. So after he comes before Samuel and Samuel sees that, yes, David is the one anointed by God. He'll be the great leader of Israel. Saul was in the place at the time, but David was the one who had the anointing. In verse 13, the scripture says, watch this. Then Samuel took the horn of oil And anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And y'all read this with me. And the. And the. The spirit of the Lord. Came mightily upon David. From that day. Forth. You see, in the Old Testament, before the cross of Jesus, the Spirit would come upon people to empower them to do what they needed to do. God's anointing is coming upon David's life to empower him to do what he would need to do. Under the new covenant of Jesus Christ, the Spirit does not come upon you. The Spirit comes inside of you. The Spirit doesn't come up on you for a specific task or even for a a short period of time. The Spirit comes in. The Spirit, the very life of Christ comes inside of you. If you are in Christ today, you've been anointed to take on your Goliath. You have what you need in the Spirit. Might not have the experience. Your faith not, might have, might not be enlarged to the point you're ready. But you have been anointed by God. If you are in Christ today, you have the Spirit of Christ in you. And David would be the one that would go out and take on Goliath. One other thing that's really, 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 really fascinating about what's going to happen is that when Goliath taunts the armies of the living God, if there was anyone, if there was anyone that physically 
could have taken on Goliath, it would have been King Saul. Because the scripture said about Saul in 1 Samuel, way back chapter 9, that he was a choice and handsome man. And there was not a more handsome person than he among the sons of Israel. From his shoulders and up, he was taller than any of the people. If anyone from a physical stature, if anyone could have or should have gone and taken on Goliath, it would have been King Saul. But it's not the physical that matters here. It is what matters. What matters is the content of the heart. Saul might have had the size, but he didn't have the heart. David did not have the size, but he had the heart. And physically, last thought before we go, last thought. When you look at this physically, there's only one thing you can conclude. David was inferior in stature to Goliath. God was allowing to come into his life more than what he could bear. Have you ever heard someone say that God won't bring anything into your life? God won't put anything more on you than what you can bear? Have you, have you raise your hand if you've ever heard People say, God will not put more on you than what you can bear. That is bull. If you could bear it, why do you need God? That whole idea has been taken from a scripture in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that says, No temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you'll be able to endure it. There, he's not talking about trials and challenges and Goliaths. He's talking about temptation of your life. Two very different things. If you could bear it all by yourself, then why do you need God? I believe God will allow more to come into your life than what you can bear. Why? So that when you submit to His life inside of you and you see the Goliath fall, you will give honor and praise and glory to God because you know a power came upon you that was not your own. But if you can do it, you don't need him. So you need him. And David had him. And his anointed was upon his life. So this morning I have no idea what your Goliath is. What that specifically looks like in your life. But I really believe. That if you have the Spirit of God in your life and your heart has been changed, He's preparing you for a point in time that you can take on your Goliath. And then let Him do that which only He can do. So as you stand with us this morning, that's the penetrating question that I want to ask of you today. Have you? Have you? Have you come to a point in time, a place in your life where you've surrendered your heart, you've surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus? Have you? Have you really come to that time and place in your life? Have you? Really? Can you say today, man, I know. I know. Or are you just playing games? You tell your parents what you think they want to hear. You put on a good front, come to church, you show up. You mouth the word, the songs. On the exterior, you have all the appearance. But here, 
truth be known, your heart is as empty as a well that's dried up. By genuinely giving your life to Christ, He will fill you. And He will anoint, I'm telling you, He will anoint you for what He has for you. Because if you think this story is only about David and Goliath, then you've missed a much bigger historical and spiritual context. He wants to do something through your life. To impact another life. To change the world. It's not just about you. It's about what He wants to do through you. So let's pray. Let's stand with this posture today. Of our arms out and our hands up. If you need to talk to someone, if you need to pray with someone, when this time concludes, you can find one of us. We'll share with you. We'll pray with you. If you just need time alone, Open up your heart and your life to be filled with the Spirit. Father God, we thank you so much for your love and your grace for us.